noche de sobre un vivo. Lucas, my Spanish lessons are paying off. Bienvenido, Ecuador. This is the newest Monday company, Monday Old. I think the formation of this company shows why this group can, can provide tremendous returns for shareholders. This started out as a luncheon Lucas had with two personnel from Kim Ross and May of last year. We got the phone call, a few of us, to start looking at it later in May. First trip to Ecuador was in June, with Lucas to meet with the government. We then proceeded to start raising money, close the deal, do the things in due diligence as necessary. We pulled teams in. I was running a uranium company for the last 14 years for the family. Now I'm running gold. You'll see names that you've probably seen before. We've been taking a few, uh, two people recruited a few from the Williams team and other groups within the London group, and we've added a few new people as well. But it shows, I think, the strength of the group to move quickly when we see an opportunity, the depth of the group to be able to bring, bring resources together to pursue something quickly, and now the team has put it together to see this through to fruition over the next 18 months. The, the, the lawyers, yeah, there you go. Fruits Del Marte, what is it? Well, it's one of the best undeveloped gold deposits in the world. And I think you'll see a really big application. So in summer, what we got? Well, we've acquired a deposit in Ecuador that is roughly about 10 million ounces, average grade just under 10 grams per ton. One of the richest gold deposits in the world. Some of the gold holes when they drilled this in 2006, 2008, 235 meters, 35 grams per ton. This is one of the most continuous, compact core bodies known today. We're going to be able to move quickly. We acquired this in December. We're going to be producing a feasibility study in the first quarter of next year, making a production decision by the third quarter of next year, and hopefully be producing our first goal by late 2018, 2019. The deposit is very compact. It can support a very small mine but we'll be one of the largest gold producers in the world, producing over 500,000 ounces. We not only acquired this deposit, we also acquired 35 other concessions along a corridor in southeastern Ecuador. Kinross, who was the, the seller of this, had done significant exploration work prior. They'd actually permitted two areas, cut the drill pads, were all ready to go when they made the decision in June of 2013 to leave the country. They were really quiet, and essentially they gave us these two binders and said, here you go, go drill. It was the, they considered it, their VP of exploration considered it to be the best exploration prospects they had in their company at that time. We pulled together, I think, a good management team, and above all, we're hitting Ecuador at the right time. It's kind of good, nice to talk about this, because keep talking about oil prices. Ecuador is a member of that whole pack. It's the smallest member, produces about 550,000 barrels a day, but its economy was very much tied to oil. When Lucas, when we first went down, oil prices were in the 70s, and they still were okay then, but since then, obviously, oil prices have fallen significantly. The economy, they realized they must diversify their economy. It's really oil and agriculture. They produce bananas and uh, flowers, uh, cocoa, and, and shrimp but they need to diversify. The pressure to diversify is even greater now with where oil has, has dropped to. So where are we at? This is Ecuador. It's quite a beautiful country, actually. We have the Amazon region here, the high Andes that run through, the coastal, and then what you can't see off that map are Galapagos. So four main regions of Ecuador. We're down in the southeast corner, only about 10 kilometers actually from the Peruvian border. To get to the site is actually quite easy. There's very good highways from uh, the project here all the way through the coast. We have daily flights from Quito down to Doha, which is the fourth largest city in Ecuador. Actually hosts two universities as well, so it's going to be a very good source for actually I've already signed an agreement with one of the universities to start training programs. And then it's about a four-hour drive along paved highway and about 40 kilometers of gravel road to get to the site. Ecuador is one of the fastest growing economies right now in, in Latin America, and the World Bank is projecting it for it to be in the top five over the next few years. It is, though, you can see, pretty low on foreign direct investment. 
That's why they need mining. That's why they want mining to come in. There's two potential projects, ours, and one just to the north of us called Mirador. It's a large copper porphyry. Ecuador in 2000 left the Sucre, and now it's a U.S. dollar-based economy. So we have no currency risk. Everything we do is in U.S. dollars. And they're getting very aggressive when it comes to mining. There is a, a, a type of, they're actually, the mining industry was just formed in January of this year. Previously, mining was a sub-industry underneath the oil and gas. Now it's a full-fledged industry. They implemented the mining law in 2009, and then they've been continually refining that and improving it. And the president actually hired a firm with McKenzie to look at and try to evaluate how they can, how competitive they can with their mining fiscal regime and mining law more competitive with countries like Peru, Chile, and Colombia. That effort is underway and anticipates seeing more changes to money law coming about later this year. We have a couple of things we have to work with with the government, the exploitation agreement. Again, Kinross has taken this through almost to completion. So what we now have the opportunity is just to kind of refine it. So we don't have to start from scratch. This one here actually we're rethinking this. Canada and Ecuador have a very strong multinational treaty that provides investment protection. We may decide that this is less risk, let's just go with the Canadian treaty. We are a Canadian-based company, and so we can, we can uh, work under that treaty. So this one we may actually decide not to go at all. This is our concession law. As I mentioned, 36, 36 cash concessions, 86,000 hectares. The deposit is just situated, situated here. Here's the crew border. The other, the other mine is looking going in, it's right here. It's a very significant property condition. The two things you gotta worry about when you set a line under it, you may have heard it, you see other projects such as Campbell Grande and a few others, are relocation and surface rights. Kim Ross has already acquired all the surface rights. We have all the rights we need to build the road, to build all the facilities we need. We don't have any worries about that. We own that land. The other thing is relocation. We have no communities. The nearest community is about uh, 10 kilometers away. It's a small community. We have I think, 30 communities of two to 500 people within the area, which will, will provide good labor, but we have nobody that we have to relocate. So those two risks, surface rights and relocation, we don't have at all. This is the deposit. This is a plan section through the deposit. It's only 1.7 kilometers long. It's only about 350 to 150 meters wide, and it's about 250 meters in depth. On the long section, you can see here, here is the topography. So here, these are 50 meter blocks. We're only, we're only about 40 meters below surface. So this means it's going to be, we're not talking about a big shaft, and if you come in, essentially it's going to be ramp access. And this war body, this is where most of the resources, and the next slide is where we get to the real juicy bits, the resources are here in this small area. It's open to depth and open to the sub. This is actually a portal that Ken Ross was driving. They got in 600 meters when my decision was made in June of 2013 to walk away. What they were, why they were putting this in was actually to do exploration on the southern part, and also there's going to be secondary egress for the underground mine. <coughs> mine workings are going to come in here from the north, much closer. We're actually doing the permit right now, we can't be opening that. We may go in and use that as secondary egress. We may also, it may help speed up our development and provide us with further exploration outside. But this is the resource. You can see that it's very small in terms of tonnage, but very high grade. Our indicator is 9.6 grams per ton. The, and that's the, that is about a two gram per ton cutoff. I've seen block models where we've increased that from two grams to 18 grams per ton, and we still have about 35% of the goal. So there is some very, very high grade components of this mine. And that's what's going to enable us to be able to mine at very high production rates, but very low mine rates. So total, we're looking at just under 10 million ounces, and about 15 million ounces of silver. When you put that up amongst the other undeveloped gold deposits in the world, it is the largest and one of the highest grade undeveloped gold projects right now 
Illinois. Talk about the upside of this promotion. Again, this is work that Ken Ross did, and this is a little bit further to the south of the Fruit Del Norte deposit. Fruit is right up here. This is some um, airborne that they flew. This one right here in Paragon has got us very excited. There's actually, this is what's called an epithermal deposit of Fruit Del Norte. So what it was was magnetic fluids that were coming up multiple events. They estimate, you know, just estimate anywhere from 8 to 10 events. That's why it's so high grade. And because of the fault, it gets so intense. We see the same center, which was the very top of the deposit in Imperial. None of these have been drilled yet, that surface expression. And we're looking at maybe drilling these this year, possibly doing some drilling up here, but definitely some further exploration this year and next. This is a project, though, that's just not a resource. Aurelian and Tim Ross have spent $280 million already on this project. I remember what Lucas said earlier, we bought it for 240. So when this was first discovered in 2006 by a brilliant, their first hole, 237 meters, four grams per ton. Kid Ross acquired it in 2008, and because of our presentations are on our website, we don't like to drop Kid Ross's nose in it, but I can tell you they paid 1.2 billion for it in 2008. They then proceeded to put over $200 million in it in drilling, pre-feasibility study, a feasibility study. Then they realized that this actually wasn't feasible. It was a pressure oxidation circuit, very complex, needing 5,000 tons a day or more to be fed to it to even try to make it economic. But that old body's not big enough to do that. My plan wasn't feasible. So Kinross actually started looking at reducing the throughput rate and going to a much simpler flow sheet, and that's what we're doing. So 3,500 tons is a very small amount. And looking at what's called now GFL, a gravity flotation leak. 30% of the gold we're going to get right off the very first circuit, right off the gravity. Then we'll run a flotation process, pretty simple, pull a concentrate, which will be mostly gold and silver, and we'll sell that to smelter somewhere in the world. And then we'll do a leach to get a final recovery. Very simple flow sheet, significantly reduced capital. And also the mine, much more flexible, very typical long hole scoping mining methods. We're going to use paste backfill, we'll put most of the paste the back in the mine. Very low construction risk or operating risk. This is some photos. It is a beautiful area. We're at 1,400 meters. This is the camp, 250 person camp, dense rainforest. I think Lucas tried to walk it off or somewhere, but didn't get very far. This uh, camp is in very good shape. We're actually up to about 200 people right now in camp. The, uh, this is the 150 kilometers of core that's been drilled in the area. And this is the portal entrance, the sub-portal that I mentioned. We're just looking at reopening this. This is the Proposed plant site and tailing area. You can see it's very dense rainforest. It's rainforest, but it's actually not that bad. It's about 14 to 1500 meter elevation. So we have no mosquitoes, we have no issues with malaria. It actually is quite comfortable. It cools down in the evenings. It can get a little warm. The only issue is we have three and a half meters of rainfall a year. We're at the equator though, so it's not like we have a rainy season and a dry season. We just have rain every day. It's not sure how long it's going to be, whether it's 12 hours a day or 15 minutes, and then the sunshine. But it's, that also is very good for planning, for construction, and everything. It's not like you have to really worry about we get three and a half years in a couple months, which is where you can't have it in parts of the world. And then a dry season, so everything has to be done in a dry season. This is to get lots of rain, but it's very easy to design for it. This is some of the infrastructure. So I mentioned we're going to produce a concentrate. So the project can drive on very good highways over here at the Boulevard Court. That's a photo over there. You can see there are four ships docked there. You don't have to do much work here. And the concentrate, we're not talking about a lot of concentrate. We're going to have to build a big concentrate, load up a shed, and all those types of facilities. This is going to be shipped out in sea containers and bags. It's not very much. This is the highway from Ecuador. Correa over his last seven years has put a tremendous amount of money 
and power and highways and airports, such that it's pretty easy to get anywhere in this country. So what are we doing right now? We're doing a 12,000 unit drill program. This is one of our drills, our Ecuadorian drill contractor. Uh, the drilling is not for the resource. It's purely to provide for a feasibility study. There's some metallurgical work that we're going to do that's actually underway in Santiago. We're doing some uh, geotechnical, other geology, civils. Really just in order to make it feel more comfortable about what we're going to put in the feasibility study. We've got a team that we've been really lucky to time. We pulled the team together in Latin America. And prior to this, most of the engineering firms have laid out well over 50% of their staff. So the staff were the left of the stars. And we walked in and we want to do a feasibility study. We've been able to put some very good teams together. So the cost of Wheeler is leading everything out of Santiago. NCL is a mining company. They did all the mine planning for Tim Ross. They're very familiar with the project. They're also Santiago. Paul Cripper Berger out of Lima is doing all the tailings. And that's our pay for the geotech and how to cook, how to separate Canada and doing pace. So we've been able to pull together a very good team. The other key component is in Ecuador, they have the mine license and the mill license. So it was two separate licenses. Because Kinos was looking at changing their mind on the way they're processing it, they stopped the mill license. But the mine is fully licensed. So if we wanted to today, we could say we're going to start driving the drift in to go start exploiting the ore body if we wanted to. What we've been able to do to minimize the risk is convince the government, let's just make it one EIA. So this one's still in place, we're just going to amend it now to include the plan. That's significantly less risk than saying you're going to have to spend this other one, but you have to start from scratch for the plan. So we've minimized the risk, and now this is all well underway. We have baselines that we had to update. But this is, we're looking at probably about a year's work in order to get this amendment through. So this is our timetable. We closed the deal in December. We're on the 17th, because we had 18 months from the day we closed. So on the 17th of every month, there's a, an email that goes out to me to every one of the staff, and it's another month that's gone by. I think everyone's going to get an anniversary card on June 17th of this year. It might have everyone have one year left. The team's doing a great job of putting it all together. So we submit our phase change application in June of 2016. Government has 60 days to approve that. Then we move forward. We're already actually starting work on financing. And first production will be 18, early 19, at roughly about 500,000 ounces a year. The other aspect of Kinross did a very good job, and it's very important in countries in Latin America's community and social responsibility. Their program that they had set up was top notch. Enabled us to just essentially step into their shoes and keep it going versus having to try and build something where there was bad relationships. So we're doing a lot of work here with environmental responsibility, social responsibility, and artisanal mining. Currently, we have five analysts that cover us. Three more are to pick up coverage here. You can see that uh, on a consensus basis, we're currently in about 375 a share. Target is 640 a share. All have no performance advised. And you can see roughly where they're looking at right now where this project could be. This will be one of the lowest quartile gold producers in the world by 2019. <coughs> Management team, the board, and Lucas, myself, Carmel Danielle from CD Capital, they were big investors. They put 40 million into the original deal. Um, 